and welcome to Reliving My Youth. My name is Noel Fogel. My guest this week is actor and author Eric Anderson. For horror fans, Eric is best remembered for portraying Rob in Friday 13th, the final chapter. He discusses getting the role, his epic line, and whether or not he's a horror fan. Science fiction fans will remember him portraying Commander Kieran McDuff in Star Trek The Next Generation Season 5 episode of Conundrum. He discusses finally getting a role on the show and which role he actually was in the running for on the show. If you can name a uh, drama in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, he likely got starred on it, whether it's NYPD Blue, Felicity, 30-something. Eric always had a standout performance. He also had a role in the short-lived baseball drama Bay City Blues. That show had an amazing cast featuring Sharon Stone, Dennis Franz, Ken Olin, and Barry Tubb. We'll talk about Barry Tubb, who was a guest on uh, the show last year. Now, Eric's an author. He wrote his latest book, Rabbit, A Golf Fable. It is very, very good. I got halfway through it. I recommend it to everyone so far. Had a great conversation with Eric, and I hope you enjoy it. Last week, I released my 300th episode. It's funny, you had a lot of contemporaries of mine during that period of time, which is, I guess, goes part and parcel with your theme, right? Right, yeah. Like last year, I had uh, one of your uh, teammates from Bay City Blues, Barry Taubon. Oh, wow. How's he doing? What's up with him? He was good. He's in Texas, living the cowboy life. You know, he's pretty much detached from Hollywood and doing everything. But he was he was waiting for the uh, Top Gun sequel call that never came. <laughs> <laughs> that poor guy. Yeah. Uh, it's funny with Barry because he was, you know, he was a scion of the oil tubs in Texas. Yeah. And his, I think his uncle or grandfather, great, what is Ernest Tub was the. Yeah. He, he mentioned that. <laughs> fiddler or the picker. Yeah. Yeah. And Barry and I were in the same acting class in 1980, I guess 81. Okay. And uh, and I didn't own a car. And so when we first started shooting Bay City Blues, Barry would drive me to the set. Oh, cool. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I'm going to mention that show. I'm going to tell you how I discovered it and everything because I, oh. I, I used to work for ESPN and um, they used to show it like religiously. I stories about that show. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it, it was on ESPN Classic for, for a while. So I'm like, oh, wow, I've never heard, heard of this show. And it had an amazing cast, so it was unbelievable yeah. cast. I mean, yeah, every, every one of those people, you know, kind of it was just it's like something. I don't know how that worked, but everyone kind of went on to something in the business and something. Yeah, way. right. It's a shame that it never didn't last, you know. But that's what happens. <laughs> the night before our last day of shooting, when they before episode eight, um, Dave Milch came down. Mm -hmm. One of the things about having back in the day that we used to always do is that instead of going to lunch, I did this on 30 something too. Okay. We'd go to dailies that were shot the day before. Okay. And so the casting members of the crew, usually cinematographer and some people like that, would go and watch. You grab something from to, to eat and then you yeah. would go watch the dailies. And for someone like on Bay City Blues, it was very new to me. That was my really my first real job. Right. Uh, I'd done a little bit on a TV show called. Um, for love and honor, I played okay. David, uh, a henchman within David Caruso's <laughs> bad part of the army thing that we were doing. But right, and and I had the guts. I don't know if the guts, but I had the stupidity to get that one job, which only worked two days, and go in and quit my job waiting tables. Right. <laughs> Luckily, I never had to go back to waiting tables. Oh, good. In my life. Right. So, nice. but um, when basically blues rolled around. I had played, I had gone out for the college baseball team and uh, I, I had, I had some abilities Yeah. and uh, I wasn't as good as any of the, the people that they had there, but, but the coach needed a certain amount of players that were just going to walk on. He couldn't, he, there weren't that many scholarships yeah. position one at the time. And so he kind of put me on the, on the roster and, uh, this guy went on to coach, uh, Dave Gorey went on to coach Texas, I think, to a national championship. And Orrin Freeman, who was our pitching coach, went on to be a, the pitching coach at Florida. And, okay. and he just died of a heart attack recently or a couple of years ago or something. But 
And um, I, uh, I could throw pretty hard. I didn't have a great deal of command. Right. In fact, I had very little command, <laughs> especially in the strike zone. Right. So if the ball got, you know, these guys were hitters, and if the ball got, came on over the plate. It was crushing it, yeah. It was at the airport, yeah. you know, <laughs> which was pretty far away from our stadium. Right, yeah. And, uh, I, I remember coming in or in a preseason game and striking out the side, and then the Oren looking at me and saying, you want to go out another inning? And I said, yeah, sure. And I came back out in th three consecutive home runs. I gave up. And that was pretty much it for me. I, yeah, I was, that was at the very right. back of the bullpen at that one. Yeah. <laughs> but in Hollywood terms, that that was that was a pretty good pedigree. Okay. So I they were casting the show and uh, I walk into the office and there's Steve Bochco and Jeffrey Lewis and Rick Wallace and Gregory Hobble are all sitting on a couch across the room. And when you walked in the door, they threw a baseball at you from across the room. And they eliminated, I'm sure, 50% of the people that walked in the room and went, oh, like this. Right, yeah. And that wasn't going to happen to me. You know, yeah. I, I just snagged it one-handed. And as I sat and talked yeah. to them, I was showing them pitching grips for a two-seam fastball and, and, and how I throw my slider and, and things like that. And then we had a, uh, there wasn't much dialogue that I had to read, but I had to read. And I, I joked with them a little bit. I, I remember saying to Steve Bochco, who was a season ticket holder of the Dodgers, I said, are you a real fan? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I said, well, so you show up in the third inning and leave in the seventh? <laughs> right. That made the other three guys crack up. So that finished. And then I got a call from my agent saying, um, they want to see you. They want to do the baseball test with you. Okay. I like what you did as an actor. I want to do the baseball test. I said, okay. We're well, going to CBS Radford. There's, they have a little lawn area back there. And they're going to, Frank White, who was a second baseman in the Chicago White Sox organization. Got screwed up here. Okay, is that better? Uh, he, he, he was the baseball coordinator. Okay. So at some point, he looks at me and he goes, you're the pitcher, right? I go, yeah. He goes, okay, you. And then he pointed to this guy. Kind of a squat guy from Pittsburgh, looked like a catcher, and said, and says, okay, kind of paced it off 60 feet, six inches, and right. gave he had a mask and chest protector and a glove. And I had spent two weeks basically getting ready for this one moment. And I wound up and I just unleashed all that I had, which right. had been in the mid 80s by, okay. you know, still in my 20s. So, yeah. Uh, which, if you've never seen an 85 mile an hour fastball, it's pretty fast. It is, right. Nothing compared to what these guys No, throw. not now. So the guy never saw. It. The guy just held the glove up there, yeah. went right past his ear, <laughs> and hit Gary Marshall's Bentley in the front left quarter panel. Right. And Frank White turned to me and said, thank you. And then turned to him and said, thank you. And I, by the time I got home, I found out I got the job. Right. Oh wow, that's that's great. <laughs> who was like the best uh, besides you, of course, the the best player from that cast? There were a couple of guys that were pretty good. Um, Julius J. Carey the third. You know who he is? Yeah, on to do Enter the Dragon or one of those movies. He did right. one of those things. Uh, he uh, Ken Olin was a really good ball player. Yeah, um, Jeff McCracken could kind of play. Um, Eddie Velez could kind of play. He was the shortstop, I think. And uh, even Patrick uh, Cassidy was, the, we all kind of, I thought, felt like, I felt like we could all look like we were baseball players. Right. No offense to Barry Tuck. Yeah. <laughs> but he hadn't played baseball. Yeah. Yeah. I do have an anecdote about him one time, though, and I don't know if he'd ever cop to this again, but he was, I wouldn't say he fancied himself a, a method actor, but... <laughs> There's a scene in the in the in the you've seen it. I said in, yeah. I think it's in the pilot where he pukes. throws up. Yeah, on the mound. Yeah. <laughs> so he wanted to do it for real. <laughs> and Greg, Greg Hoblet, the director, let yeah. I, I, I can get myself there. You got to let me do it. Right. Did it by drinking a lot of grape soda for some okay. reason. So when he finally got around to actually doing it, it was purple and it was unusable. Yeah. 
<laughs> I just remember that. Why would you do that? There's plenty of techniques. Yeah. That's <laughs> that you could use to make it look real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the entire props department is sitting there going, hey, we do this for a living. Yeah. Well, yeah. what a fun gig, I tell you, to be able to. We we were all really green, all of us. It was our first job. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much. And we did things wrong all the time. And we had to be instructed by people like, no, you don't do it that way. You do yeah. it this way. For example, when you finish a scene, you go rehearse the next scene. And then you go change while they're setting up. Yeah. Absolute logic. The very first scene we finished shooting on that show, everyone went to go change because we didn't know that that was what we're supposed to do. And the production's Greg Hobbit, who's the director, threw a fit and ended shooting for the day because we didn't follow the, the, the time right. honored rule of how this thing is supposed to go. And I guarantee you that not, there's not a single soul that didn't ever again rehearse in the costume that you were in before you changed into your new costume. <laughs> but as you, as you, as you got to the, as you, we, they built a stadium, like a, what would be a, I guess a, maybe a single lake stadium now in Sun Valley out here in the, in the San Fernando Valley. Okay. And uh, they had three great uh, red stripe smokestacks in the background. So it looked like a middle, it's called Bay City. I think it's supposed to be Michigan or something like that. Oh, Middle, yeah and um but that's where you went to work you parked your car and you went to work and when you walked into your trailer there's a baseball uniform hanging there wow. and it's a beautiful million dollar baseball field to just hang out with these guys and throw the ball around and wait for your, your turn such a great gig and when it ended i was so sad yeah. but it, it was so lo so lowly rated yeah it's it's a shame though because maybe now with so many channels and streaming and everything like that it would have had a chance yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to say that Bochco and his crew, they were really ahead of their time every time. Right. And luckily, they've got to NBC for a long time. And then eventually ABC stuck with them uh, and allowed their audience to build yeah. stuff uh, with Hill Street and with uh, NYPD what? Blue. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I ended up working for him probably about eight or nine times in my career over okay. the year. And that was the first one was uh, right. basically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause yeah, he, he gave you, well, you had a nice recurring role on NYPD blue for a while. Yeah, no, I would played uh, what's her name. So, uh, yeah. Husband. Kirk and dolls. Yeah. yeah. Husband. Yeah. yeah. You're real, real low life. But uh... at that time, Milch, that was Milch's show. Oh, okay. So yeah. And it was, a, there's a documentary that's actually made about that season when he's, that was, that was, he he was he was great. I really loved yeah. working with him. I mean, he was a true artist and right. And uh, but we would do things like it's so unconventional in television at the time. But we would shoot a scene, a master of a scene. First of all, we wouldn't have the scene. Right. We show up to work, and there would be uh, who was. Uh, who was the tinker? One of the tinker's sons was a TV, episodic TV director. You remember which one? Grant Tinker's kids? I don't. Mm -hmm. So one of him, one of one of them was there. Yeah. Sitting in a chair, in his director's chair. And we show up, Andrea and I, and I guess there was one other person. And he goes, the scene takes place here. I go, we go, okay. He goes, we don't have the scene. It's on its way. Right. Hang out, get made up, get in costume, whatever. By the time you get here again, the scene will be here. But with David Milch, he was like David Mamet in a lot of ways. You had to say every word, not only every word, but the right period, the right comma, the right thing. And there was a script supervisor that hovered around you like a like a wasp. Yeah. That if you didn't, she would basically say, No, no, you didn't say and here. You have to say and right here. And and to be able to learn stuff on the fly in that moment, I don't think I've ever been able to do that again, except for in that moment. Right. I was able to do that because of the pressure of the situation. Anyway, the scene comes, we learn it, we shoot the master of the scene. Then David comes down before we shoot coverage and he sits there and he goes, Eric, hate that jacket you're wearing. 
<laughs> I go, well, you know, you must have approved it or whatever. You must have said it was okay before. He goes, yeah, I did, but I don't know what I was thinking. Let's go get you a new jacket. <laughs> then him and I go off to the, the wardrobe trailer and get a new jacket. But now everything we shot there is useless. Yeah. We have to start all over again. <laughs> that never happens in television, let me yeah. tell you. So... That's funny. And it's a guest star that never happens because that's not your job, man. Yeah. Wow. Your job is to your job is to to get it done the first time. Yeah. And not have the star melt down in your presence. Yeah. <laughs> but that'd be the reason for it. Right. And uh which which you know that became that became my ambition over time. I think I had other ambitions when I started, but over time, because I had a really lengthy career of doing that, I understood what that job was. And I understood that job well enough to know, this is where you stand. This is where you're supposed to be at this moment. This is who you let know where you're gonna be at any moment. Right. And, this, and you've learned all your dialogue and you're ready to go. And if you count, I don't know. I did. I probably, I think if you add up all the recurring stuff, I, I probably did close to 300 episodes of television in my career. Right. And I can maybe count 10 where I felt some amount of autonomy in, okay. in, in whatever, where there was an interest in getting a performance from me that was other than me getting it out the first time so they can move on or switch the camera around to get to the whoever the star was, you know? And I, so I, that became for me a very important part of my thing was give them that, give these people that. And there was many a night in my career where it was Monday night, it was five o'clock. On Mondays, you start early. So you start at seven and you want to finish at seven. Or you start at 6 30, you want to finish yeah. at six. But now the Monday night's game's on. And the guys in the camera truck are watching it on a TV. Yeah. And, and the sound guy's got a little monitor and he's watching the game. And you have a big monologue that you have to do. And you know that if you don't get that thing in that moment, these guys are going to be, it's the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many times that that's why I did it, that I would go in and do it for those people. Right. Not for performance reason or whatever. Yeah. So they could have a take that they could go, let's move on. Right. And and that's a I don't know I don't know it it might be part and parcel to just the way what I rose to based upon how much talent I had I got to a certain place I didn't transcend that in some way and and it may have been that the reason I worked for as long as I did because I was that guy yeah I was the guy who could show up and deliver that and um, I know there were directors that I worked with multiple times because they were like I don't have to worry about you you yeah, right yeah and. Uh, and and I often would see guys that were would be a lot more indulgent about what they wanted out of their performance in the same position or situation that I was in. And I would become very frustrated because I would think you're not understanding what the scenario is. You're not understanding what your job is. And yet when I would see the show, they were so good. They were always so good, you know. Yeah. So, it's yeah. funny. Yeah. So how did how did you learn to do that to you know basically come in and just be professional and just you know worry about the crew and just like move on i think it started with that uh, greg hoblet throwing his clipboard against the fence and saying we're done for the day after we didn't okay we didn't do the thing correctly right um but after that it just became you you became you get a sense of that you know as a guest star in television I recurred on a lot of shows, so there was some continuity on some yeah. of the stuff at the time, or a lot of the time. Uh, I was just there for the week. The directors just there for the were back in those days. Now, now the directors are tend to be connected to the staff, to, yeah. uh, they're, because of their tour, they're the, they're the writer as well, you know. Uh, and they all the episodes are written and they they block shoot and they'll do all the episodes as if it were a feature. Back in the, in the day, we would get the scripts the night before we start shooting okay. and, and new pages every day uh, and scenes changing and all that stuff. And you knock the show out in seven or eight days. And then they did 22. 
but you were only there for those seven or eight days. And that director was only there for those seven, eight days. So we were not the franchise. The franchise were the regular players in the thing and the writers who were going to actually deliver the show in the end to the, to the studio or the network. And you just kind of, you know, your accommodations are, are negotiated. So depending on where you are in the food chain, your accommodations, my accommodations got to a place that were kind of somewhat decent, but they never really improved to, I never, you know, had the suite or I never had the yeah. big tree or whatever I had. I had what's, I think I topped out at what's called a three banger, okay. which is a, it's a nice little room. And I was completely comfortable in that room, but it was, it was a trailer of three as opposed to a trailer of two. Uh, which the, the stars of the show would get. Yeah. When I did, when I was a regular on a show, for example, or in a doing a pile or whatever, I would get that, but yeah. not not right. as a guest. And and so because you're only there for the week, you're treated. They don't know you, so they assume there's this assumption that you're just this 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 thing. I don't know what it, it's it's a. I don't, I don't want to say an idiot, but you know, you never hear you never hear someone say, you never hear someone say, oh, you know what, he's an intelligent uh, lawyer or he's an intelligent doctor, but you do hear the term, oh, you know what, he's an intelligent actor. Okay. So the assumption is we're not, yeah. you know, that, that, yeah, that's the supposition pretty much all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 there's a there's a person, as you know, the, the second AD or the, even the trainee who's responsible for getting the actors through the works getting them ready to go. And they're being yelled at by the person above them who's being yelled at by the person above them who's being yelled at by the first AD eventually and, and, and if possibly the director at some point to make sure that the wheels are in motion, that they don't have to think about this stuff that's going on. And I learned very early on, oh, I can make this person's life very much easier by just acceding to their wishes and not pushing back on anything. And that became a mantra for what I would consider to be uh, a professionalism. How, 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 do, how do I make things easier for these people for this week? Because I'm only here for this week. I'm not here for any other times. And uh, I don't know if it's a, some people might say I'm a people pleaser, but, you know, I think if I, if I, I honestly, if I think that there was something that I did that was so fantastic that everyone needed me to be in their show, that would have happened and it didn't, you know? So it's like, this became the thing that I prided myself on, that I could do this. And uh, I was I was good enough, I don't know if it's good enough, but I was lucky enough to be able to go into an audition because I did most of my, almost all my work, I would say in the 90th percentile was never an offer, it was all, jobs that I had to go in and, and read against okay. other actors and to win the jobs. Back in the day, and you went to the audition and it was a four o'clock thing and you signed in and there was five guys there. You knew all the guys. Right. It was great. And we would all know each other. We see each other and stuff like that. And and then that guy would walk in that had, you know, that had gotten the last two jobs that we'd all read for him. We're like, oh shit. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. And uh and uh, and then they would start calling people in and, and you had a four o'clock appointment, but now it's 5.30 and you're still three away from you. And I'm, I'm probably walking out, uh, you know, but you drove to the studio and you got out of your car and you walked on the studio lot and you went to some bungalow somewhere to do this. And it was a whole life, it was a whole thing that happened that was just kind of fantastic about all this stuff. But over those years, I won a lot of those jobs. I got a lot of those jobs. And that to me was everything. Right. The job itself was often disappointing and sometimes difficult and uh, like dealing with personality sometimes and, and trying to not make yourself the center of attention or, or whatever. Uh, and you saw mistakes were made and then they added the footage and you know, oh God, that take I did back then was really good, but they never used it. Uh, um, or I thought it was good. The, the, the winning the job was, I don't know what that was. I don't know if that's, right. that's makes me out to be this craven individual or whatever, but that, that was fantastic to, to get home, get a phone call and say, yeah, they want you after 25 guys, if they saw 25. Right. Yeah. Some of the guys who I really respected 
that I beat out. And I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was a, a fabulous was time. So going back to Bay City Blues, that's very early in my career. That's 1983. Right. What, what else did you know me from? Uh, I mean, well, we, I want to mention, we'll talk about uh, Friday the 13th a little bit and uh, Star, yeah. you know, Star Trek and a couple other things. But with Bay City Blues, um, that show had a lot of like unknown actors at the time who look at, you know, Sharon Stone, I mean, a megastar, you know, Michael T. Williamson. I mean, you know, all the fantastic work he did, you know, Ken Ole. I met in Albuquerque recently. And oh, yeah. We had never, we hadn't seen each other in 40 years. It was like, oh, wow. a, like just two minutes before. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And then, you know, uh, Bosco favorite, Dennis Franz, who, I mean. He disappeared. Know, yeah, disappeared. You know, we, we didn't see his butt in the show, which was good. <laughs> but, you know. oh, but they tried to get Barry's butt in the show. Oh, really? <laughs> that was the time. First time that was, there's a good example is they got is that Bochco puts did a cut of an episode where Barry yeah. drops his towel leaving the manager's office. Okay. Michael Murray's office. Yeah. And they kept it in the thing and the network cut it out. And it took him, I don't know how many more years before he got a butt. Yeah. Got to be oh, dead. Yeah. I think it was about 10 years. <laughs> right? Years later. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now you mentioned like you did a lot of recurring roles as well. Was there ever a job you got, you, you think you knocked it out of the park, you know, baseball term, obviously, um, that you thought it'd be a recurring role that it wasn't? Huh. No, but there were about three or four jobs that were listed as possibly recurring that I was under the assumption I was going to become this person's boyfriend yeah, or husband or, or something. Uh, there was a sh this show called almost grown. Okay. That show. I Tim remember that. And Eve yeah. Gordon who went on to play my wife and Felicity. Yeah. Uh, I was to be her boyfriend and uh, as a kind of a threat to Tim Daly at the time. And we'd shot one episode and then they canceled the show. Okay. Um, I was I was considering myself a show killer there for a while. Right. <laughs> I'd have a couple of times. Yeah. Um, but no, the not you know the knocking out of the park thing is such a weird. It's such a weird kind of concept. I don't really watch my work. I've okay. never I've watched it for years. Uh, but my response to my work when I watch it is. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, that wasn't that bad. You know, it's not it's not like the knocking out of the park thing. I have friends of mine who, they're great actors or whatever, but they watch their work and they can actually say, yeah, I really nailed that. Okay. And I've had plenty of situations where uh, trash truck come up the street here. Uh, where a crew member has come over to me and said, hey man, that was really good. And I think, oh, okay. And then I see it and I go, what were you thinking? Because <laughs> it's, it's not self-critical or whatever. It's just that for whatever reason, in the moment of creation, when I'm doing it with the other actor or the camera or whatever it is that I'm responsible for in that moment, that's the best that it, it will ever be for me. And so now you put music on it and you edit it and you sometimes change the narrative from what it started with because you, the storyline is going to go in a different direction. So it doesn't really work with what was in your mind at the time. And it, it, it gets degraded in my mind. Right. But I, I look at other people's work and I go, wow, that was fantastic what that guy was able to do there. And I've talked to him about it and they're like, I have no idea what's going on. I, but, no, I don't think so. I think there was a yeah. bunch of things. And the other jobs that were, I was hired to be recurring, I was hired to be recurring. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, you mentioned Felicity. So you knew that you were going to be Carrie Russell's dad and be on the yeah, show. That, was, that, yeah. was, uh, that was a script that I read. You know, there was a period of time where I, I did kind of burn out from the, this job, doing this job. Right. And uh, I... I uh, I had this interest in, in, in golf. I had been a golfer, an amateur golfer, and uh, I started hanging out with this young guy who was a teaching pro at this one place, and I was working on my game with him, and he was a player, and he was going to go and try to make it 
uh, at least on the minor league tour before he went on to the PGA tour. And uh, he was playing at some local events. And I said, hey, let me caddy for you. I'd love to caddy for you. Yeah. I ended up caddying for this guy for a couple of years, basically. Oh, wow. Disappeared from the scene a little bit during that okay. period. And um, I caddied in the 99 US Open, actually. Oh, wow. At Pinehurst. And uh, where are you? Where, 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 where do you where, I'm where in. I'm in Connecticut, so I'm originally from New York City. So, okay. yeah, I, I haven't played in years. I'm I'm terrible. It's hockey, it's hockey right? Hockey, baseball, I'm, I'm, everything. Yeah, everything. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, so I I I I I took off and kind of did that for a period of time, and then when I came back, I started writing for television a little bit. I was selling. Uh, I had guys who I producers I worked for. That were you know my age and we right. got a couple of California and stuff like that and I was they asked me to write a script for them and I would write scripts for them and I was kind of doing that I had an office over here not far from over here on the Miracle Mile on Wilshire and and with them and I was just kind of doing different stuff and not really given much interest in acting and at some point I finally thought I need to make more money or something I need to get something going on right I've gone through a divorce and and. Uh, I was living in the in the guest house of the house that I I own now, but uh, I I moved there and I said I I gotta I gotta I gotta get something going yeah. here. This ain't working. So I called right. my agents back up and said, Hey, I don't know if you guys are interested, but if you want to put me back out in the world, I'll go back out in the world. Yeah. And I went back and did some real crap. I mean, silk stockings and Gross, yeah. show with Leslie Bibb in New Orleans. I forget what that was. Uh, they just put me, they they just said, you, you got to be willing to do anything. And I said, I, I was, and I did, and I got those jobs. And then suddenly the script for Felicity came around. Okay. And I was like, holy crap. This is something that, this, I hadn't read a script like that in years and years. And years. Right. And I know who JJ was from the rest of Daniel and from regarding Henry. But he was new to TV. It was his first yeah. TV stuff like that and i didn't know anybody else that was involved in the production and i read that and i go i want this job yeah and i found out later from them that they had seen me on 30 something okay and they knew they had created an entire myth around me based upon that so when i walked in the room to do the audition they were giggling oh my god billy seidel's here and i was like i had no idea yeah. you know of course i destroyed that myth by <laughs> I just joined, but I ended yeah. up getting my job, and uh, I was really happy to do that. The Ringer is doing uh, some kind of Felicity rewatch podcast thing. That they've oh wow! Okay. So that they want me to comment on it. I will. Well, I, I will see if that happens. Or not. Oh, cool! Yeah, because that show was like one of the ones that put like uh, what was it? WB, I guess it was back then, on the map. It did. Yeah, it yeah. really did. Yeah, and then he went on to do Alias. We, we talked about that, Michael Vartan, and then. Uh, Star Wars, you, you kind of ruined that, but that's a whole different story for another day. <laughs> I'm Billionaire Beach, man. Yeah. <laughs> Carter Beach. And uh, he's, it's funny, he's worked with a lot of people that I know. I haven't talked to him, I don't know, it's been many, many, many years. And I will tell you that, and I don't mean to, to disparage, disparage anyone at all, but I work with hundreds and hundreds of actresses. No one with the power in her. Yeah. Very Russell. With with just the commitment and the yeah. gift and 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 the, the ethic, all that stuff, unbelievable. She was right. unbelievable. Yeah. And then I don't know if you watched the Americans when that was on. I watched a little bit of it and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to watch the diplomat, which I heard is really Yeah, I heard good. that's great too. I have to start that. But yeah, the Americans, he should go back. And that, was, that show was, she was tremendous in that show. But she was, it, it's really yeah. quite, when you work, when you sat across the table from her, yeah, right in a scene with her, you, you can see sometimes if you look, you can see me going, holy crap. And she's just like, just yeah. marveling at yeah. how good. Yeah. Right. And I remember like the big uproar when she got her hair, when she cut her hair short. And yeah. that was like a big uproar for like a while. It's like, then I'm not watching the show anymore, people said. Yeah, it's like then you, like, you know that you made it. Yeah, <laughs> thank God social media wasn't around back then. Oh, totally. Yeah, that it would have made her wear a wig or something like that. <laughs> Such a 
backlash. <laughs> yeah, you. Had, I mean, I had a really good guest starring appearance on Star Trek, and I'm a big. Star That's a funny Star story fan. too. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know any of the lore of that? I read for that show. Okay. Ten times. Wow. And I also read for Riker. Okay. Along with Chris McDonald. And it was the three of us that were being under consideration. And John Franks got the job. Okay. But then I, so in subsequent years, I, I would come in and read for different episodes. But it was in season five or whatever. My agent finally said, hey, enough. Either hire right. or don't. Yeah. But he's not coming in to read for you anymore, basically. And, and I, I don't know, for whatever reason. Anyway, uh, so I showed up. And that's when Franks was going around going, this is the guy. This is the guy that could have. This this is yeah. the other guy. You know, right. could have could have been me. Yeah. And, and that episode, you actually did replace him, which is kind I of did. Funny. I did. Yeah. Conundrum, yeah. Which yeah. is everyone loves that, that episode. They just yeah, it's really good. It's yeah. Good. yeah. Yeah. My favorite story of that episode is that. Um. By the way, do people curse on your thing? Go right ahead. Yeah. Because I'm I'm doing it. I'm going to do a really bad imitation, and when I do, I'm going to do the the dialogue verbatim okay <laughs> so um i walk into the makeup trailer the very first day and patrick stewart's sitting uh by the door kind of close to the door with his very special makeup person and then lavar burton sitting there and there's a chair in between it and the, and the ad says take that chair Eric. and i so i sit in the chair and just as i sit down patrick stewart takes the script and flings it against the mirror and i said was it me and he goes, we lose our fucking memories again. <laughs> and uh, which is like the sixth time it's happened in the years that they've been doing the show. Yeah. And I'm like, this is how it starts for me. Right. <laughs> this guy being pissed off. <laughs> and then he starts messing with LeVar Burton about his, you know, LeVar's, all his different charity work and his men's clubs and, and all that kind of stuff. And across me to him and then asking me what i think of it and i'm like ah, i gotta get out of here i can't be in there right <laughs> so the thing about star trek this is it's it's how i boil this this is how the pro boils it down mm -hmm. is that there's tunics that you wear that are form-fitting and, and, yeah. and really thing they don't want you to drop a cigarette ash on them or okay. mustard or whatever so you have a t-shirt on under them. And when you leave the set, when they, they're, they're breaking or they're moving the camera or they're doing whatever, they take that off you. And you go out, and you, everyone's walking around in their t-shirt all the time. And then when they call you back to the set, they call you back in reverse order of what the hierarchy is. Okay. Some way. So that the person, the first person that gets called back gets their tunic on, they sit there and wait, and then they call back all the other things. And because I was the guest star, I'm one of the early callbacks for the tunic. And so I sat there as each member of the cast in some kind of weird hierarchy gets called back. But then it becomes a competition at some point at the end between the person who was called back second to last and the person who's called back last. And I, there were a couple of times when Patrick Stewart was called back last, but got there before Jonathan Frakes did because okay. Jonathan Frakes was on the phone or he was doing something else or something else was going on. Yeah. And he just, that was just not acceptable to him. And, and that whole process took about 20 minutes every time we changed, every time they took our tunics off. Yeah. We would sit there and watch that thing. And um, as, you know, the guest star who's just there for the week, that was was, was fascinating to me. Not right. the script or the sets or yeah. or the show and, or any of that stuff because of that. You know, it was all that. It's like with Friday the 13th, you know, there was so much, People want to know if I was a fan of horror. I go to some of these conventions sometimes, and and people are so into that, even though it's that movie was shot in '83, right? Years ago, I mean, 40 years ago, this this Halloween we shot, we started shooting that movie. Crazy, <laughs> and uh, and yet I, I don't, I didn't, I don't, I'm not, a, I, I, it's not my thing. That genre is right. not my thing. Is it your thing? Are you a horror? I, guy? I mean, I like it. I mean, like I've I've seen them all. I mean, 
I find not that you're because you're on the air. Besides the first one, your yours is probably the best one, the most well written. Well, I think that it's universally thought that final chapter is is yeah. yeah. Number four, final chapter is considered the best made. Yeah. yeah, one one of the cable networks. I forgot which one has had a marathon on like all week. So oh, really? you get the one where he went to Manhattan, and then yeah. there was one where he was in space, and then there was one where someone ate his heart and then became Jason, and then it was just like really this guy is dead but but well, i didn't realize it but the first four the yeah. one that ends with four is jason yeah everything after that is zombie exactly jason. exactly I didn't, I mean, yeah this is this right. is totally by the fans not by right me. yeah because that's why uh, tom savini came back right for the fourth yes. one because he right. wanted to kill jason yeah he had to be dead at that right and uh i love tom yeah and uh and, and so, uh, and then of course, there's a lot of glee and excitement when people see me at these things because of my famous line while I'm being slaughtered. Yes, yes. I say, he's killing me. Yeah. I'm screaming, he's killing me. And I've had to explain this. I explain this in documentaries and, and, right. and explain it in panel sessions at some of these conventions. And people still don't get it. They still think it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Of course, he's killing you. Right. So when I signed the picture with that they put in front of me that they want to me, it's a it, yeah with quotation marks. Of yeah. course, yeah. So I have a funny story about that. One of my previous jobs was working with like esports, so like video games and stuff like that. So we would do like you know competitions and stuff. Sometimes we would just do like fun shows. And they had a um, Friday Thirteenth video game that came out a few years ago. And one, <laughs> I think I die in the beginning of it, right? I mean, somebody in a plaid shirt is dying at the very beginning. Yeah, of the... someone dies, and they they use the line a lot in the video game. He's killing me. He's killing me. Okay. So I just, you, you get a crap. Yeah, you know? it's it's hysterical. But um, but you were like one of the characters who you don't root for to be get killed. You know, a lot I of them. Still, you know, yeah. Zito took me aside the night before we started shooting, and he and he said. I said, what are you looking for here to him as far as the character goes? Yeah. It wasn't really my third job, fourth job of all time. I was shooting Bay City Blues while I was doing this. Work. Okay. Uh, and uh, they try to work the, work the days. And then at some point, I sh had to shave my mustache. And then they had to put a fake mustache on me for Bay City Blues. But yeah. Uh, so Josie says, says, says to me, he goes, this is what I want. He goes, and everyone, have you ever seen one of these movies? I said, no, I've never seen one. He goes, well, this is what happens, is that all, there's all these, these stupid kids, and they do stupid stuff, and we try to make it as stupid as possible. Right. When they get killed, everyone cheers. Yeah. When you die, I don't want anyone to cheer. I want them to be terrified, because all that's left is going to be the dog, Corey Feldman, and Kimberly Beck. Yeah. And there's going to be no one there to save them. Again. And uh, I said, okay, I can do that. And he says, so I don't need you to be anything but focused on what your chore is and what it is that you're trying to do. And, uh, and do that, 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 and we'll, we'll try to con concentrate on doing that in every scene. And, you know, so on uh, opening day, which is April 13th, 1984, I bought 20 tickets at the Fox Theater on Hollywood Boulevard where it was opening for my friends for the eight o'clock show. 14 of them were in the lobby by the time the met hockey mask blows up at the beginning of the day. Oh, right. <laughs> so like, I, we're not staying for this. Yeah. And they're all in the lobby talking. But six yeah. of my friends actually stayed for the whole thing. And I didn't realize that this was the whole thing. They cheered when those kids died. Oh, yeah. And up and down the aisles. They're talking back to the screen and throwing things and stuff right. like that. And I, and then I died and it was silence. And I thought, oh my God, he was right. He did exactly what he wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because usually one of these, all these movies have at least one of those characters where it's like, oh, you feel bad. It's like you genuinely feel bad that the person got killed. Whereas the other ones, you're like, like you said, the hooting, hollering, throwing food and stuff like that. I know you didn't have any scenes with him, but did you ever do the Crispin Glover dance? I did not do the Crispin Glover dance. Okay. <laughs> I, I did hang out with him a little bit. Uh, right. 
the thing. I thought he was just such a interesting and odd dude. And yeah, one day I had a day off, and uh, we were shooting in Santa Barbara, or, uh, Buellton, basically up in. And I went to Solvang, and there was a handmade toy store. And uh, I was walking through this toy store, and I think I bought something for all the cast that was there at the time. And what I bought him were these little things that you pull a string, and these this 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 like parachute, reverse parachute would yeah. kind of go up in the air. And it was like a package of three, and you could pull the string, and the thing would like fly up. And yeah. And uh, I bought them for him. And I remember being put in a van to go back to the hotel and seeing him in the middle of a field, having all three in the air at the same time. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's really cool. And then I ran into him. And we used to have a great used record store down the street from where I used to live. Uh, maybe a month and a half later, I ran into him at the record store. I said, hey, hey Crispin, what's up? He goes, he had no idea who I was. He had, he, he, he was just right. completely... I go, Eric Anderson, we just finished that movie together about a month and a half ago. Uh oh, 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 yeah, yeah. No idea, not a clue. Not a clue who I was. Yeah, that's too funny. You should have said parachutes, parachutes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think you, I don't think you would have got it. Yeah, man, it's, it's too funny. <laughs> fun. It's been fun to go to some of these conventions and run into these people. Like Judy Aronson is great. Yeah, and uh, you know Ted White just died. The guy yeah, I saw that late last year. Yeah, and he had an amazing career. I mean, here it's how how long it was. You know, John Wayne said one of these things, and he's telling you stories about John Wayne, he's yeah. telling you James Garner, who he doubled for, and you're just like your mouth is just yeah, jaws open. You're just like, oh my god, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. because yeah, because you know, Jason is like, you just need a big body to play him. It's not like Freddy Krueger or any of those. It's like because you just need a big a big body and but like Ted it's was also the stunts, you know. Yeah. And, he was a, such an accomplished stuntman that he could guide both the director and the cameraman into how do you make how you sell this, how you make this look real. Right. And uh, I think that that was probably the biggest investment, best investment that they made is they hired him to do that. You know, to not only be that, but the stuntman too. Right. I was there the night that they shoot the scene where the devil for Kim goes out the window mm -hmm. and up the car yeah and you know you think about how you just don't know that that's going to go right right you know and someone's going to fall 35 or 40 feet onto a the top of a vehicle and then there's yeah. water cannons in the side to blow the, the windows out yeah and we just assume that everyone knows what they're doing right but, it's 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 a low budget movie that's being yeah. shot, and it was. But luckily, all that stuff worked out. Yeah. Okay. And you um, you guys shot that like in the winter, right? We started in uh, like a Halloween, yeah, and then it's it we we ended up in Topanga Canyon at this place called Kelly Gulch, which people I think still come from all over the world to go visit. Okay. They built the kids' house, uh, in Topanga Canyon, which is. And it's 35 degrees, you know, it, it was, it was freezing. Yeah. And, and the last, you know, when I auditioned for it, it was this, the summer of 83. I was on my way actually to San Francisco to meet up with some friends to go see the Padres three game series with okay. the Giants and Candlestick. And, uh, I'm cursed to have been a San Diego Padres fan. No, no one could be more cursed than I am this year, by the way. Uh, uh, and I guess the Mets too, but yeah. <laughs> you guys are neck and neck. <laughs> so, such an embarrassment. Yeah, I hear you. A scrappy team here, you know, for 50 years, then have all this wherewithal. Yeah. Just be a dog. You know? No, I, I hear you. <laughs> uh, and so, um, I, I, you know, I went to the audition. I didn't really know, and I wasn't really that interested. I was a I'm pretty snob. I was snobby. I still am yeah. a snob. <laughs> I did the audition, and and I didn't know that. And I, by the time I came back from San Francisco, they said, "Hey, they really, I think they want you for this movie." And I'm like, oh, "Do I really want to do this?" And my yeah. manager was like, "Yes, you do," yeah. because Kevin Bacon did one, right? Because this, right. Just Amy Steele did, one, you right. know. Was, and I said, "Okay." 
I'll do it. But I never read the script. I just had some scenes. And then I got the script and the last 40 pages are night rain. So it's winter time yeah. and it's exterior night rain, basically. And they got the big water tanker trucks out there and they're just blowing rain everywhere and it's freezing. And of course, the continuity for that is you got to be soaking wet. <laughs> out before you shoot again. Yeah. And uh, I've never been so cold in my entire life, ever. <laughs> this day yeah. right but i imagine also like with the skinny dipping scene it's got to be freezing too you're shooting that in the winter as well uh, if you ever talk to judy aronson she'll tell you that you know ted wife well, kind of basically saved her life that was at a different lake the one that where she dies yeah and she's turning blue and ted wow. just basically threw a fit yeah and and got her warm and got her out of the water and told him to stop shooting wow. and every time we were at one of these panels or whatever she would tell the story about how ted yeah. saved Wow, yeah. is that why he didn't want to be credited in the movie? He, he him, and Joe didn't like each other. Oh, okay, that was the whole thing. And then Corey Feldman and him—I don't know if Corey was really trying to be method or whatever, but Corey Feldman just would mess with him all the time. Right, like, like shoot, like, like had a slingshot and would shoot his legs when he had all his makeup on. And, yeah. You know, I don't know. It's just stuff that he would continue to do, and 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 which is considered, which Ted considered unprofessional. Okay. And uh, anyway, it, that was a whole crazy. It's just a crazy, crazy time, and it's weird that forty years later, I'm I'm going to Niagara Falls, I think, and uh, to celebrate the fortieth anniversary of the beginning. Okay. Right. And Kimberly Beck is actually coming to join me at that one, and uh, oh, cool. um, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's weird that people still have that that the interest in it. I just think it's really kind of funny. It's really yeah, funny. it's crazy. I mean, these conventions are like all over the country. Every every weekend, there's another one. Yeah, I mean, cause the, the New York one here is it's huge. So done that. There's the Chiller theater in Germany. Okay, I haven't done that. I wanted to try one of those. And there's one in Connecticut. Actually, ironically, Jonathan Frakes is going to be here next month. So oh, good. Yeah. But I'm the first jobs he ever had in television. I wrote an episode of for oh, him. Oh wow. Okay. Uh I don't know if John remembered. I think he would remember it because we reconnected in some way. But when I first the first TV series that I was a I was kind of a regular on Bay City, but I yeah. wasn't uh uh I think I did seven other eight shows or something like that that they yeah. did. But I, I'm not in the regular cast listing. I'm listed as a guest star. And uh, but I did this show called Hard Copy. Uh, okay, yeah, I remember that. Me and Wendy Cruz and Fanola Flanagan in, in 1986. And uh, those are the guys the first time I was like, I'm curious about writing. And so I kind of went home. After we shot an episode, I wasn't in the next episode that much. I think I had one scene or two scenes. And so I wrote an episode in that week and then brought it in and presented it to the thing. It was yeah. probably bad. Right. They liked it enough to kind of doctor it up and actually okay. use it in an episode later in the thing. And the, one of the characters that I wrote was a character that John Frakes ended up playing. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Did, it, did it help you to be an actor? No. To, to write or no? Or mm -hmm. No, they're two different, completely different things. I mean, the actor is really... I heard Ben Kingsley say this on Mark Maron's thing the other day. It was kind of funny, but that's how I would always describe myself as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And that as an actor, you're the end user of, of somebody else's story. And uh, as much as you want to put into it, you're really given the parameters of what... The, right. hope is a, is a narrative that's been produced and uh, or at least created by someone yeah. else. You're the end user. You're the, the last indelible me, um, uh, image of that. And that can make a huge impression. But you you have to remember that you're part of a, a story that's being told. Right. This is, it's, it's, uh, it's just always been kind of my contention. And but as a writer, you get to tell the story. And I kind of wanted that control more. Okay. 
And uh, that had led me to, you know, over the years, is I, I have three novels out now. And, right. Uh, I was going to mention. Uh, yeah, and I it. Because I wanted complete control. That's like, yeah. yeah. So I'm about halfway through Rabbit right now. And, are, are you? Yeah. And I, I love it. it. It's, 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 it's fantastic. Um, it's very easy reading. Everyone go check it out. Uh, Rabbit, a golf fable. Um, you know, uh, ca- character Chuck. Chung Dawson, he's a golfer, also dealing with uh, Asperger's, but he doesn't want you know that to be a crutch. He doesn't want to use that for you know for anything. And it's an interesting way how he found himself in prison. I don't want to give it away because I was reading. I'm like, I got to find out why he, you know he's there. That's intentional that I waited. That I, that it takes a while to get there. Yeah, it does. But it's it, it's it's kind of humorous how how that how that happens. But it's it's really a. It's really good now. You mentioned you were a golf fan, you know, before. Was that why you decided to write this? It was more I knew it was like funny. I don't really book or something. Yeah, I don't work in that genre really. I didn't ever worked in first person before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I write the books that I write are uh, they're most people find them extremely tedious, but the uh, <laughs> they're it's kind of oxymoron, but they're called speculative fiction. It kind of takes place a little bit in the future and kind of uh, imagine a different world, a different time, a different way. Of it. And um, there's a trilogy of books that I was writing. Uh, and I started to write the third element of the trilogy. And, and I was going to write that in the first person. And I just could not find the voice. I just couldn't do it. But I always knew that there was going to be a, I was going to write a book about golf because I spent a lot of time being very close in that world to a lot of the elements of it. And I thought, I want to I use this experience yeah. somehow. And um, so I, uh, I suspended the writing of my third element of my trilogy and wrote the rabbit okay. and, uh, and then published it about a year ago, I guess. And it was published. And uh, um, I don't know if I ever write another book like that, that I think I'm, I'm back doing the other thing. Yeah. And I found, I found the voice, the first person voice of what it is that I want to do. And I'm okay. very happy to be doing that. Right. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no one's clamoring for for the third book. That third okay. book, right? Rabbit's got Rabbit got a great review, and and yeah. and um, and uh, the people that I know that have read it have really liked it. So yeah, yeah I'm looking forward to finishing it. Uh, ever think about optioning it for a movie? And I think you would try to shop that around. Or I don't, I don't know who is somebody going to make a movie about a golfer. I I, I don't know if that's the I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking Happy Gilmore, but I mean, there have been pretty decent golf movies. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Tin Cup, they're all, they all tend to, yeah. to think about Rabbit is, is that if you don't play golf, it could, might be a little frustrating for you a little bit because it's, it's, it, I, I did not want to insult the golfer. Right. No, I, yeah. And most of the movies that they do, they have to, to bring in an audience that's big enough, you have to, expand yeah, it. you have to be Happy Gilmore or Tin Cup or, right. Yeah. Something that that kind of makes fun of the makes fun of the formality of the game. Yeah, which from my standpoint, uh, it's uh, I suppose we might get into religious discussion because golf is more my religion than any other thing. Right. Yeah. Because there's a set of rules, um, and those the rules are sacrosanct. Yeah. Pretty much. And as long as you play within the things, and also in golf, you call the, the, the violation on yourself. Right. No one's there to do that for you. Yeah. And uh, because of that, I think that that's the way life should be. And that's how I kind of wanted to express, that's what Rabbit was about to me, was to express. And that's what allows Chunk to kind of survive in life in a certain way, is that he has this, he has to stay within the, this group of rules. Right. And if, you know, when his the ability to do that is very difficult for him. Yeah. And okay. following those rules kind of gets him in trouble a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. But Eric, I th- this was fantastic. I really ap- appreciate your time. Um, well, end this with baseball, a little baseball talk since you're a Padre fan. Um, do you like the new rules that are uh, implemented this year? Well, you know, I was a huge, like, if they bring the DH in the National League, I'm really going to be bummed. Yeah. And 
Then they did it during the what the sixty game season, I guess. Was yeah. it? I didn't notice it. I didn't notice that it was that different. Right. You know? uh, I, I, I'm not aware that the that the bigger bases are making a difference to me. I think that the whole inability of pitchers to hold on runners to on first is ridiculous. How bad they are at it now. Yeah. And uh, I think the catching position from a defensive standpoint, these guys are going to have to get better. Right. And um, so there's, I think that is actually a good thing. I, I don't mind the lack of the shift. Uh, I, I, I felt like before, it's a baseball field. There's nine positions. You can put anyone wherever you want to put them, right? Well, what else if you yeah. want to align your defense in, in any way you want to do it, you do it. And, Right. Strategically, that seemed like a good way to go about playing the game. I thought it was kind of knee jerk to to take that away, but you know, most of the people that I know think it's great that they that you have to have two guys on each side of second base. Yeah, I'm. I, I like the shift personally because and the pitch know, clock again. Yeah, games are two hours and twenty minutes. Great, it's fantastic. And you know, I want. I'll watch one sixty two. I watched the Padres play 162 games. Right. And some of those were about four hours. Yeah. And uh, I'll DVR them and go through the commercials sometimes. And if it's a, like last night, Pirates scored seven runs or six runs, in the, or five runs late in the game and 7-1, I, I just got through, I kind of fast forwarded to the Padres meekly going down in the ninth inning. But um I'm not having a problem. I, I don't, I'm, but I am a traditionalist. I want to believe that I'm a traditionalist. Are, about you, the same thing? I mean, like I'm a Yankee fan, so I mean, I grew up with the DH show. It was a great time last night. That, that was fantastic, and because it's baseball. Yeah, I watched strange. that. By the way. Yeah, I had that on. Like baseball, strange because his previous two starts gave up ten runs, and then you know eight runs, and then he got suspended for ten games because he had. Yeah, it's the, the most stickiest stuff he's ever seen on the hand. So it's 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 weird how just every every game is different. You know, they always say it's like the, the momentum starts, ends and begins with the next day's starting pitcher. And it's, well, yeah. but he last night specifically, the guy can barely barely break a pane of glass. Yeah, and, well, and yeah, yeah, he was so all you know so consistently. Not around the middle of the plate. No. <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, he, he's flirted with this a couple of times. And he's I think he's had a no hitter a couple of times, like into the sixth, maybe once in the seventh. He's he's got great stuff. It's all about the location, you know. It's, it's what it is. But so like, as a Yankee fan, you've had to go through the expectations of year year by year being a, a perennial contender. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for Yankee fans. You know, I'm not crying. Oh, this I don't feel sorry for you, but but oh, no, of course not. That's okay. But 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 this is new. For example, for the Padres to have a 250 million dollar pay. Right. There's expectations. Expectations associated with that, right? Yeah. You have that pretty much consistently, or have for many many years, yeah. had somewhere in the neighborhood of that, and yet still developed a good deal of your players from within your organization. Yeah, like like my thing with being a Yankee fan is, and I don't think the owners think that you can rebuild in new york like you have to have a winner every you got to fill the seats this and that i think the, the, the real fans the smart fans can handle a rebuild for a few years and need be rather than just keep plugging in like the josh donaldson all, all these people who just make too much money get them in get into playoffs and just lose in the first round and then just start the, the wheel of like mediocrity you know yeah. and it's just like you don't need it i think they're more concerned about making money because it's a business than winning they well, see... the Padres have had 29 sellouts this year. Right. It's G June 29th. Yeah. The most sellouts they'd ever had to this point for an entire season was 20. Mission accomplished. Yeah. I, mean, it's... I know, but that's it, it's so frustrating to watch. I just can't tell you. Because yeah. you pay all those guys. I don't know if the Yankees are the same because I don't I don't really right. for many years I didn't follow anything in the American in the junior circle. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> Uh, because they have the DH. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, 
you look at the first five guys in the Padres lineup and you, it's like, since they're all making, you know, between 20 and $30 million a year, you can't ask them to bunt. You can't ask them to hit it the other way to get the runner over from second who's doubled earlier in the inning. And, and I, I find that just so aggravating. I agree. Because, and then they say, look at my baseball card. I'll be there at the end of the season. But how does that add up to wins and losses? I don't know. Yeah, it, it doesn't. Because especially when you have this shift, you have the whole left side open. You're telling me you can't teach a left-handed hitter to go the other way in spring training? Well, at any time. You put it down the third base line, even if it's a little, little nothing, you're getting a double yeah. out of it. Exactly. Yeah, so your extra base hit. Your a hitter, hit. yeah. But no, it's all about pull power and the home runs now. It's all the outcomes and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because Josh, um, Josh Donaldson is hitting 127. I've never seen someone hit 127 with that amount of bats in almost July now. He's hitting 127? 127. Yeah. He's not even hitting his wife's weight. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. God. Eric, I really appreciate your time and best of luck. Well, good luck with everything. <laughs> And a special thanks to Eric for joining me today. Check out his website. It's eric-anderson. That's E-R-I-C-H hyphen anderson.com. And if you have a guest suggestion, hit me up on Twitter at the first all one nine, or like the page for my youth on Facebook. You can go to iTunes, check out all the past episodes we've had. While you're there, please rate and view the show. Don't have iTunes? Not a problem. Shows on SoundCloud, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music. Basically, wherever you can find a podcast, new episode comes out every week. Stay safe, everybody. We'll see you then.